failure. Following PPV in diabetics and non-diabetics. Methodology, it was a prospective case control observational study on 115 eyes who underwent past plan of vitrectomy during study period of 14 months. They are divided into two groups. One holds the diabetic people and two holds the non-diabetic controls. Concern was obtained from each and every one. Statistical tests used were chi-square and unpaired t-test. Uh, following on the data collected at uh, baseline, one and three month post past plan of vitrectomy. Surgical technique. Under local anesthesia, after transconjunctival insertion of 23 gauge infusion port and micro cannulas at 3.5 and 4 mm uh, behind the limbus, core and peripheral vitrectomies were performed and they were injected with the tamponades if needed with the same experienced surgeon. Those who underwent PPV and turned out uh, for at least three months were included in the study. Those who had corneal abnormalities, had glaucoma or strabismus, and those with the previous ocular trauma were excluded. Also, the patient who underwent cataract surgery six months before or three months after the PPV were excluded from the study. Results. In both diabetics and non-diabetics, from baseline to three months post-op, there was a reduction in the cell density and mean cell area, and it was not uh, significant. Whereas, a rise in the coefficient of variation and fall in the exogality was there in both the groups, and it was significant. Uh, Pre-operatively, as well as post-operatively, uh, between two groups, the changes were significant in all the following specular parameters. When coming to the endothelial cell loss, it was more in the patients who had silicon oil as endotamponate in both the groups. Similarly, visual outcome was uh, poor in the people who had silicon oil as endotamponate in both the groups. Discussion. Uh, in endothelium of the diabetes has a rise level of aldosterase activity. Thereby, there is a rise in sorbitol level, which causes impairment of the pump mechanism, leading to corneal morphological and permeability changes. Endotamponate agents. Uh, being more important in the posterior pole surgery had caused endothelial impairment and reduced visual acuity, uh, more pronounced in silicon oil. Uh, despite reduction in the mean endothelial cell count, no patients had corneal decomposition or the follow-up, suggesting that simultaneous dysfunction may not be seen immediately. Age and duration also influenced the cell loss. Summary, uh, there was a reduction in the cell density and rise in cell area in both the groups and it was not significant. Whereas, uh, rise in uh, coefficient of variation and fall in hexagonality was there in both the groups and it was significant. Also, the central coronal thickness raised in both the groups from baseline to post-op. Uh, among the endotamponate, silicon oil had uh, more cell loss in both the groups. It was significant. And uh, in the, with, with visual outcome, patients with silicon oil had worse poor outcome. Take home message. Uh, precautionary measures should be taken in diabetics before any intraocular procedures, um, especially with VR surgery, where endotamponate appear to affect the endothelial cells. If possible, early silicon oil removal should be considered in patients who have low preoperative endothelial cell density. So, regular monitoring of patients is essential, especially in prolonged tamponade. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you. Next Thank candidate, you. pediatric penetrating keratoplasty retrospective study for prospects in a tertiary care center. Yes, yes. Pardon? Last question. We welcome Dr. Gerald Sherich. You want, you can ask her. Last now, question session. Where is that verse? So, left. Reshika, till then, can you uh, answer a question if possible? So, how did you ensure that uh, the cell loss was because of di uh, diabetes and not because of the silicon oil? Meanwhile, if the slides are not running, can we take the next speaker? You have understood the question. Question is whether, whether the toxicity was related to silicon oil or it was due to the uh, diabetes, effect of diabetes itself. Uh, pre uh, pre stuff, they had low density. Uh, because of the silicon oil also, there can be cell loss. Micro, but, microstructural changes can be present. 
your study what it concluded whether it was due to the both diabetes and uh, silicon silicon oil aggravated the loss more sir okay. have you studied the loss due to silicon oil it aggravated the cell loss more ma'am Okay. No, it, uh, you mean to say emulsified silica and oil, otherwise without any emulsification? Without any emulsification itself, ma'am. There are uh, chances for the microstructural changes to occur. Even with the smaller amount of uh, normal silicon oil, when it gets entered into the anterior chamber through the zonules. Okay. Can we go ahead with Dr. Mugundan's slides till then? Okay. Thank you. Good morning, respected judges. The topic for my presentation today is pediatric penetrating keratoplasty retrospective study for prospects in a tertiary care center. Now, Waring and Lebson introduced the concept of pediatric keratoplasty in 1977. However, technical advances have lowered the age and increased the indication. Uh, now, we need to keep a few points in mind while uh, considering surgery in pediatric keratoplasty. These are complete evaluation of corneal pathology is difficult, intraocular pressure measurement is difficult, graft rejection is difficult to detect and treat, challenges ensue in every step, preoperatively there are chances of deep amblyopia, intraoperatively there is low ocular rigidity with positive vitreous pressure and postoperatively difficult follow-up. Aims and objectives are study aimed to evaluate indications and outcome of the procedure and to analyze the visual outcome over a follow-up period of 12 months. Uh, Ma'am, I... One minute, the slides are running on their own, actually. Slides are running on their own, I cannot continue. Uh, I need to go step, step by step, the slides are con running on their own, at their own Can speed. you give him the controls? The slides are running on their own speed, no, so I cannot... I am giving I am giving the control manually. Then timer at all. Slides are running on their own, sir. Timer at all. Shall I start from the beginning or no, no, no. Good morning, respected panelists. The topic for my presentation today is pediatric penetrating keratoplasty retrospective please study for. The, please start from where you had left. Okay. This was a uh, retrospective case review in 24 patients conducted over a period of three years. Data collection was done and systemic evaluation was conducted in consultation with a pediatrician. Examination under anesthesia was performed as and when required. Ocular evaluation included preoperative visual acuity, refraction, retinoscopy, visual evoked response, electroretinogram and ultrasound B scan as and when necessary. Now. Uh, we excluded patients with regrafts, those with microcornea, patients with loss on follow-up, those cases with intraoperative complications, and medical records with incomplete data were also excluded from our study. The following chart shows the baseline characteristics of patients in our study. Preoperatively, patients were classified according to indications for surgery. These were congenital corneal opacities, acquired traumatic or acquired non-traumatic corneal opacities. The most common indication for surgery in our study was infectious keratitis. However, deteriorated visual acuity was the indi indication for grafting in eyes with keratoconus and corneal dystrophies. Most patients in our study, as shown, belong to the 11 to 17 years age group. The pie diagram shows here that the preoperative diagnosis prior to surgery. Visual acuity could be recorded in 83% of our cases, and optical correction and amblyopia therapy at an average of three weeks showed improvement in visual acuity in 63% of cases. However, vision more than 20 by 200 was achieved in only 25% or 6 size. The following diagram shows the postoperative complications depending on number, the average age group, the duration from surgery to complications, and percentage. The following chart shows the postoperative time interval of suture related complications following surgery. Corneal allograft rejection was observed in 4 patients at an average age of 5 months. Final improvement in visual outcome in these young patients was seen, however, in only one case. We also aimed to plot a Kaplan-Meier survival curve to predict the survival of corneal graft, which showed association of vascularized cornea, intraocular inflammation, and simultaneous surgery with survival. 
the two patients in our surgery had raised intraocular pressure at the time of surgery in all patients however one with peters anomaly the iop was under control the following chart shows post operative allograft rejection in our cases now coming to discussion penetrating keratoplasty still remains a treatment of choice in poor resource settings smaller grafts and interacted single sutures may be beneficial graft rejection rates were found to be higher and earlier in the age group of less than 5 years congenital corneal opacities and combined procedures had high rejection rates in our study cases with combined pros concomitant procedures also had increased rejection rates Our study suffered from certain limitations due to the retrospective nature of the analysis, factors associated with poor prognosis, including treatment adherence, and a multivariate analysis could not be performed due to the small sample size. Future prospects include proliferation signal inhibitors, advanced refination techniques, and recent advances like cut and paste keratoplasty. The following are by references. I would like to conclude by saying the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. Thank you. Okay, uh, Doctor Subhajit, uh, what what the common indicator? What was the size of your sample? Sir, size of the sample was 24 patients. 24 patients. Yes. All of them uh, were in pediatric age group. Where uh, from starting from six months to 17 years. We considered the WHO definition and uh, UNICEF under that was came under 17 years age group. Uh, what was the years. failure rate in these cases? Overall failure rate. Sir, uh, we have observed graft failure in our cases in 25% uh, of our cases. Uh, that It is considered what? a high-risk uh, surgery, uh, the young age group. But uh, we observed uh, in that the if, commonest uh, indication uh, where the failure uh, was uh, basically infectious cases. Sir. Infectious cases yes, was sir. the least Please. least one. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Next candidate, okay. Narendra. Comparison of central corneal thickness by pachymetry and anterior segment optical coherence to Mugger. Dr. Vijay Hegde. Dr. Rashmi. No. No. Vijay. Fourth one. The study is about the comparison of central corneal thickness by ultrasound pachymetry and anterior segment OCT. So we all know that central corneal thickness is very essential in various fields of ophthalmology like selecting patients for refractive surgeries as a risk factor for ocular hypertension for the progression of ocular hypertension to glaucoma as well as in the uh, evaluation of certain corneal conditions like keratoconus and corneal edema the gold standard technique for uh, central corneal thickness measurement is ultrasound pachymetry which is a contact procedure and which which is very easy to use but recently we have several non contact techniques of pachymetry like anterior segment oct opscan and pentacam Very few studies in India give comparative accuracy of central corneal thickness measurements done by these two techniques, that is ultrasound pachymetry and anterior segment OCT. So that's why we planned the study with the following objectives: to compare the central corneal thickness by ultrasound pachymetry and anterior segment OCT in young adults, and to study the relationship of CCT obtained by anterior segment OCT with refractive status and body mass index. It was a cross-sectional hospital-based study involving mainly the young adults in the age group of 18 to 40 years. Exclusion criteria were those patients with corneal pathologies, history of previous intraocular surgeries, refractive surgeries, those who used contact lenses, and also who had comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension. Based. Uh, do you think uh, which will be the closer to the physiological part? Probably the light-based. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, you could not conclude anything like that. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any question? Thank you very much. Next, intrastomal vorticonazole as a successful adjunctive approach for recalcitrant deep fungal keratitis by Dr. Atul Biruj.
Nepsin. Permission to start, sir? Yes, please. Good morning, uh, one and all. I am Dr. Atul. My topic is intrastromal boriconazole as a successful adjunctive treatment approach for recalcitrant fungal deep fungal keratitis. It is not working. Excuse me. Pardon? Slides not moving. Yeah, not functioning. Right. Can you restart the timer, please? Uh, so my topic is uh, intrastromal boriconazole as successful adjunctive treatment approach for recalcitrant deep fungal keratitis. Fungal corneal ulcers are accountable for almost half of the cases of culture positive infections in developing countries. In view of delayed presentation and non-availability of antifungal drugs leads to complications like corneal decimatocil, staphyloma, endophthalmitis, meltic perforation and finally blindness. The treatment of fungal keratitis is challenging due to quite a few limitations like suboptimal corneal penetration, ocular surface toxicity and limited spectrum. Surgical modalities like therapeutic PK are frequently required for deep fungal keratitis with limited outcome. Newer antifungal agents such as voriconazole, posaconazole and capsofungin have a good safety profile and better corneal, corneal, uh, corneal penetration compared to conventional natamycin. Targeted drug delivery can achieve satisfactory drug uh, concentration at the site of infection and uh, in this intrastromal injection shows promising results. So aim of my study was to assess efficacy of intrastromal voriconazole in the treatment of fungal keratitis not responding to conventional treatment of topical and systemic antifungal drugs. Study was conducted at tertiary eye care centers of North India from January 22 to October 22. Patients with smear and culture positive deep fungal keratitis not responding to topical and systemic antifungal drugs including 5% natamycin and 1% voriconazole for a period of two weeks were involved. Patients with scleral involvement, any perforation, patients with signs of uh, endophthalmitis, allergic to voriconazole and one-eyed patient were excluded from the study. All patients underwent Snellens visual acuity testing as well as slate lamp biomicroscopy examination. Size of the ulcer, size of infiltrates, any satellite lesion, any pigmented lesion and height of hypopion were noted. Area of the ulcer was calculated from its maximum diameter and the dimension perpendicular to the maximum diameter. The depth of corneal involvement in all cases was extended up to or deeper than mid stroma. ASOCT was done to evaluate the depth of corneal ulcer and B scan was done to rule out the posterior segment pathology such as end of thermitis. A diagnosis of fungal keratitis was made based on clinical evaluation and positive smear as well as culture of the fungus. So total 18 eyes of 18 patients were evaluated, 13 were male, mean age of presentation was 51 uh, years, most common, cause of, uh, uh, most common cause was vegetative trauma in half of the cases, mean initial BCVA in Logmar was 0.94, all patients had anterior one third to uh, anterior two third involvement of corneal stroma. Mean size of corneal ulcer was 4.44 millimeter. Mean depth of corneal ulcer measured by ASOCT was 306.5 micron. 13 patients had satellite lesion while 3 patients had hypopion. 3 out of 18 patients had centrally located ulcer while 9 patients had paracentral and 6 patients had peripherally located ulcer. Most common organism isolated was fusarium followed by aspergillus. So out of 18 patients, 17 were successfully treated with ISV, 6 patients required single injection, 7 patients had to take 2 injections and six patient, uh, 5 patients had to, uh, they improved after 3 injections of ISV. Mean number of injection was 1.94. Mean resolution time was 18.5 days and 13 patients with satellite lesion and 3 patients with hypopion resolved completely after ISV. These are few of my patients who improved very well after uh, intrastomal voriconazole injections. This is KOH mount showing filamentous fungi. None of the currently available antifungal drugs such as voriconazole are able to manage deep fungal keratitis because of suboptimal penetration of the drug, ocular surface toxicity as well as limited spectrum of drug. So voriconazole has advantage of good safety profile and has been shown to be effective against fusarium as well as aspergillus species. Boriconazole has been shown to have better outcomes due to lower mean inhibitory concentration against filamentous fungi. The size of the ulcer and height of hypopion at the initial presentation were significantly affected treatment outcome. Patients who presented early required lesser number of injection. 
while patients with smaller size of ulcer and infiltrate needed lesser number of injection. But statistical correlation could not be made out. In our study, there was 100% success rate in corneal healing after ISV, and the mean healing time was much lesser, 18.5% compared to the previous study. Machinery et al., uh, they reported ISV as an ineffective uh, approach in treatment of filamentous fungal keratitis, while a more randomized clinical trial also concluded that interstomal injection did not offer any beneficial role in to uh, over topical. In our study, repeated interstomal injections of boriconazole have also been tolerated with, uh, without any long-term toxicity. Mean time duration between onset and presentation was 10.8 days. Large clinical trials and large sample size with long-term follow-up are warranted. So concluding, target interstomal boriconazole injection, 50 microgram per 0.1 ml, appears to be feasible and effective uh, treatment adjunctive treatment approach in treating recalcitrant deep fungal keratitis not responding to topical and systemic antifungal drugs. Though some may require repeated injections, but it reduces the risk please, of therapeutic stop, time Thank you. Okay, thank you, Atul. Uh, a beautiful study. Uh, after how much time the second injection was given once it did not respond? Sir, if, it, if there is no response to the uh, treatment given, then three to, we waited for three to seven days. And after seven days, if still there is no response, then we give second injection. And on average, similar, you repeated it on seventh day? Seventh day. Yes, sir. Not before okay. that, sir. And all of them were proven positive microbiologically? Yes, sir. Proven positive, either smear or culture. What percentage was the fusarium? Fusarium was uh, 17 mm. out of 18, sir. That's in, usual. In northeast, uh, fusarium is more common. Uh, yes, it's uh, almost throughout uh, India, this pattern now. Sir, sir. sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Okay. Thank you. Next presenter, Dr. Samrat Chacharji. Herpes simplex virus keratitis, clinical features, treatment and outcome. Good morning, uh, esteemed judges and my esteemed audience. So it is a common perception amongst the Indian ophthalmologists that HSK is a disease of the West. And this common perception or misconception is due to the fact that there are very few studies in literature on HSK in India. We have very less presentations. Even in AIOC, there's hardly anything on HSK. And except for dendritic keratitis, most of the ophthalmologists, comprehensive ophthalmologists, find it difficult to make a diagnosis of other types of herpes simplex keratitis. So the aim of this present study was to report the clinical types, treatment pattern, and outcome. So this was a retrospective study over four years where we included new patients of herpes simplex keratitis, and we classified it according to the latest classification of Chodosh and Wong. So we had 172 patients. There was a male preponderance. We had patients from all age groups, but majority of the patients were from their 30s and 40s. Of all the types of stromal keratitis, uh, of all these types of HSV keratitis, HSV stromal keratitis without ulceration, that is the immune stromal keratitis, was the commonest, followed by epithelial and endothelial keratitis, and lastly was stromal keratitis without ulceration, that was the necrotizing keratitis. If you look at the age group, uh, the youngest patients were stromal keratitis without ulceration, the immune keratitis group, and the oldest patient was patients with endothelial keratitis. If you look at the treatment pattern, all the patients were treated by acyclovir, but there was a lot of variation in the treatment pattern. Which, uh, for example, in endothelitis, you can see that both topical and oral uh, antivirals were used. Also, uh, twice a day prophylactic dose and five times a day therapeutic dose has been used. However, as per corticosteroids, where we use 1% prednisolone acetate, it was much more uniform. Most of the patients with endothelitis were treated with prednisolone acetate, while no patients with epidural keratitis was treated. Again, there was a lot of use of topical antibiotics. You can see even in endothelitis, there were few patients that were treated with uh, topical antibiotics. Some patients with uh, immune keratitis were also treated with, uh, with topical antibiotics. Some patients required surgical treatment, and this included uh, therapeutic PK in one patient, tarsorephy in two patients, and cyanoacrylate uh, adhesive with or without MMG in uh, six patients. If you look at the treatment outcome, more than two-thirds of the patients healed, and there was a 40% was lost to follow-up, and in four cases, we had uh, three cases, we had secondary uh, bacterial and fungal keratitis, and one patient, there was perforation. If you look at the improvement in visual acuity, the uh, maximum improvement was seen in stromal keratitis without ulceration, and the worst was with stromal keratitis with ulceration. 
there were 21 episodes of recurrence in 16 patients. The most common recurrence pattern was somal keratitis without ulceration. Uh, those who had primary epithelial keratitis had equal chances of recurring as epithelial or uh, stromal keratitis without, uh, with, uh, without ulceration. Those had stromal keratitis without ulceration, that equal chances uh, they had, mostly they recurred as stromal keratitis without ulceration, but some also recurred as with ulceration, epithelial disease or endothelial disease. Similarly, this kind of variation was also seen in endothelitis. So if we compare our study from the Western or even the Asian, we find that uh, uh, we had a slightly more male uh, preponderance than other studies. Uh, stromal keratitis was the, uh, without ulceration was the commonest. This is in contrast to the Western literature where it is with ulceration. But because stromal keratitis with ulceration, we in India, we need to distinguish it from bacteria and fungal. So this requires, uh, you know, PCR and virology which is not widely available, so it's, prob it's probable that it is underreported out here. There are very established treatment guidelines for treatment of HSK, but in our study and also in other studies, we find that oftentimes these guidelines are not adhered to. So in conclusion, we had younger patients, so there's a lifetime risk of ocular morbidity. However, stromal keratitis without ulceration was the commonest type, so visual impairment and they had the uh, better uh, visual recovery. So lifetime visual impairment is probably low, which is, uh, which is very optimistic. And within a center, there should be much more uniform treatment pattern and adherence to the existing guidelines. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, the study is really a good one. Uh, what percentage of people did you put on oral uh, acyclovir of them, particularly of the deep keratitis? Yeah, so, so oral keratitis, all patients with stromal necrotizing keratitis were treated with a therapeutic dose of oral. A prophylactic dose was used for endothelitis. But that, as I said, so there was a lot of variation. So around 50 to 55 percent patients were treated with oral acyclovir. Some were treated both with uh, topical and oral. Uh, so this kind of uh, variation was there. Okay, that's the usual pattern. One more question or query is that, uh, why did not you put them on fluoromethylone, uh, which is uh, non-penetrating, uh, rather than prednisolone that has additional uh, penetration and uh, 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 this thing, uh, side effects of the penetrating? See, see, the guidelines do not talk about fluoromethylone. I've never used, uh, I've used fluoromethylone, but that has uh, to prevent recurrence by putting the patients, once they heal, and putting them on fluoromethylone for a very long time. But as primary treatment, neither does it, uh, the head study or the AO guidelines or the guidelines from Australia, they say that you should, they do not talk about fluoromethylone as a primary. And this is most, this is because it's still a surface, mostly surface drug. Endothelitis, then uh, stromal keratitis, uterine ulceration, they are deeper. So okay. the treatment of choice is prednisolone acid. And okay. that's what we have adhered to. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Samrat. That was an excellent study and good thank data you. getting out from India here now. Uh, I would also like to ask, was there anything else used apart from acyclovir, like oral um, gancyclovir, or topical gancyclovir or oral valesivir? No. Uh, like in, in my center, we are not using topical gancyclovir or oral uh, this thing. Valacyclovir. Sorry, oh, valacyclovir. So we are not, you are not using this. Because All patients were treated with These days, that is also rampantly being used. So Yeah, they are being rampantly used. That is true. And uh, <coughs> why we are not using gancyclovir? So that, that's the question. The ointment is there. It's a lesser Trice dose. a day. I still feel very comfortable with acyclovir. It's usually. It and usually works. There are talks about acyclovir resistance. We still don't have enough literature Data. to show how much of acyclovir resistance it is. It is very safe drug. You Maybe. can give it in any age group. So still Maybe acyclovir after publishing this study, we can step up to studying the differences between acyclovir and topical. Yeah, so suppose I would be very you know, encouraged to do so if I find that I can prove an acyclovir recalcitrant patient. And probably there may be a small, because there are reports from other places, so there may be a small subset of patients who are recalcitrant to acyclovir, but how do you identify them? So but yeah. that's a challenge. Okay, thank, thank you, you, sir. Can thank we you. have the next?
ക്ലിനിക്കോ മൈക്രോബയോളജിക്കൽ പ്രൊഫൈൽ ഓഫ് മൈക്രോബയൽ കെരറ്റൈറ്റിസ് ഇൻ എ ടെർഷറി കെയർ സെൻറ്റർ ഇൻ ഈസ്റ്റേൺ ഇന്ത്യ ബൈ ഡോക്ടർ സ്മൃതി സ്മൃതി രഞ്ജൻ അഞ്ജലിക്ക അഞ്ജലി അഞ്ജലി സോറി Good morning one and all respected judges I am Dr Anjalika Padi my topic is clinico microbial profile of microbial keratitis in a tertiary eye care center in eastern india corneal diseases are among the major causes of vision loss in the one world today second only to cataract microbial keratitis is infection of the cornea caused by a wide spectrum of microbial agents the, though the clinical signs help us in distinguishing the various causes of microbial keratitis the etiological agents of microbial keratitis vary considerably between continents countries and also within the countries depending on the geographical area climatic condition and host factors we did a hospital based observational prospective and clinical study in which we took 152 cases over a period of 1 year the all newly diagnosed cases of microbial keratitis were included in our study however children below 18 years of age pregnant women one eyed patients scleral involvement impending perforation desmetocele concomitant endophthalmitis and suspected viral ulcers were excluded from our study data collection was done and clinical evaluation was carried out using slate lamp and b scan wherever required diagnostic procedures like corneal scraping direct microscopy bacterial and fungal culture and antibiotic susceptibility was carried out bacterial culture was said to be positive if there was confluent growth at the site of inoculation of one media or there is growth in one media consistent with direct microscopic finding fungal culture was grossly identified by its colony morphology and pigment production antibiotic susceptibility pattern was carried out using kirby bot diffusion method coming to the results the most common age group of presentation in our study was 41 to 50 years of age male showed a higher preponderance most of the patients were coming from rural area and they were most commonly involved in agricultural work more than half of the patient in our study presented to us within 1 to 7 days of onset of symptoms history of trauma was present in 73% of the patients and vegetative matter followed by trauma with soil sand and stone was the most common type of offending agent the most common ocular risk factor were eyelid ab- abnormalities followed by dichrocystitis and diabetes mellitus was the most common systemic risk factor more than 76% of the patient had already put various topical medication before coming to our center the gram stain positivity was for bacteria in 45 cases and positive for fungus in 57 cases koh was positive for fungus in 95 cases bacterial culture was positive in 34 cases and fungal culture was positive in 68 cases and 5 cases showed positivity for bacteria and fungal both and they were classified as mixed infections the most common fungus isolated in our study was aspergillus flavus followed by aspergillus fumigatus and the most common bacteria found was staphylococcus followed by streptococcus the antibiotic susceptibility of various bacteria was found these are the uh, mekonkey agar plate showing staphylococcus and aspergillus and fusarium coming to the discussion our sample size was re- was relatively higher compared to the other studies done in the geographical area the mean age group was 43 years and males were most commonly affected in our study as similarly seen in other studies however in a study done by china cow et al in china females were most commonly affected probably because of higher employment of women in the agricultural sector in their part The most common ocular risk factor in our study was entropion however in a study done by Patti et al in eastern india only dacrocystitis was the most common risk factor our culture sensitivity was relative positivity was relatively high compared to other studies we found that fungal keratitis was more common than bacterial keratitis which is in contrast to the finding done in eastern india by patti et al where bacterial keratitis was more common cephalococcus was the most common bacteria which is similarly found in other studies however among the fungus aspergillus was more common compared to fusarium which was found in eastern india so i would like to conclude that Uh, the due to the diverse clinico microbiological profile of microbial 
microbial keratitis, the adoption of empirical therapy cannot be reasonably supported. Hence, a multi-pronged approach like meticulous clinical examination, early establishment of the etiological agent by microbiological workup, timely initiation of susceptibility-guided antimicrobial therapy can prevent emergence of resistant strains, reduce morbidity, and drastically improve the visual prognosis and quality of life. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, which part of uh, country this study was done? So we did in Odisha Eastern part. Okay, Odisha. so you found the most common uh, microbiological pattern of bacterial. You are mixed. So fungus was more common than bacterial. Fungus was most common followed by? Bacterial. Followed by bacterial. Yes, sir. And amongst the uh, organism? So staph. Yes, sir. Staphylococcus was more common than streptococcus. Which staph? So aureus. Aureus. Yes. Okay, and in fungi? So fungal, we got aspergillus uh, flavors followed by fumigators. All right. Any viral? Sir? Viral. Sir, we excluded viral ulcers. Okay. Thank Any you. Any correlation between uh, diacrosis and uh, bacteria? Which bacteria you found? Ma'am, we found most commonly it was uh, with uh, staphylococcus. Or Even in diacrosis status? Yes. So, Dr. Angelica, out of the 150-odd patients that you've screened, how many were microbio-positive? Ma'am, 70.4%. So, almost half. Uh, yes. And uh, uh, you had excluded p patients with impending perforation. Any particular reason? No, ma'am. Okay. And did you find any parasites like uh, acanthamoeba or pythium or any other? No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next, yes. Next one. Up. Clinico Etiological Profile of Therapeutic Keratoplasty at Tertiary Care Center, Hyderabad, Dr. Mauktika. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Kondapalli Mauktika, finally a postgraduate from Sarojini Devi Hospital. My topic of presentation is Clinico Etiological Profile of Therapeutic Keratoplasty at Tertiary IK Center, Hyderabad. As we all know, therapeutic keratoplasty refers to replacing a diseased corneal tissue with that of a healthy donor tissue just to remove the diseased focus. TKP is routinely performed in developing countries like India, where monocular corneal blindness is a silent epidemic, particularly in the working age group of 0 to 49 years of age. Infectious keratitis is the most common indication of TKP. In infectious keratitis, fungal keratitis is more common. The two most common fungi responsible for fungal keratitis in South India are Fusarium followed by Aspergillus. My purpose of the study is to present the clinico etiological profile of therapeutic keratoplasty at Tertiary IK Centre in Hyderabad from September 2022 to March 2023 for a duration of 6 months. Objectives of the study is to indicate the indications of therapeutic keratoplasty. Materials and Methods The type of the study is hospital-based prospective observational study done for a duration of six months in the Department of Cornea and Trauma, Saroshni Devi Eye Hospital. Out of all patients presenting to cornea OPD, those who needed therapeutic keratoplasty were followed up with inpatient admission, comprehensive ophthalmological and microbiological examination and post-operative re re resolution of infection. My sample size is 20. I included a brief uh, chat that shows how we diagnose eye infections at Saroshni Devi Eye Hospital. The results are, out of 20 patients, 8 are females and 12 are males. The age range of the patients is 32 to 80 years with a mean age of 53 years. 17 patients were from rural background, 11 patients were agricultural labourers. These are the preoperative photos of the patients undergoing TKP. 5 had history of trauma to the eye with wooden stick. 3 had history of trauma with vegetative matter. History of diabetes, hypertension, asthma and rheumatoid arthritis are seen in the study subjects. Two patients were actually using topical steroid drops that they procured from pharmacy without any consultation of doctors. One patient was using systemic steroids for rheumatoid arthritis prescribed by physician. Clinical presentation at admission, all are unilateral cases, right eye is affected in 7 cases, left eye in 13 cases. Corneal perforation at admission is seen in 10 cases, hypopion in AC is seen in 8 cases, secondary glaucoma in 2 cases. Microbiological analysis, out of 20 cases, 12 showed positive fungal growth, out of which 5 are fusarium, 3 are aspergillus, 2 is pencilium, 1 is curvularia and 1 is bipolaris. These are the SGA medium showing the growth of the bacteria, fungi, KOH mount showing fungal elements, aspergillus flavors, aspergillus niger, fusarium pencilium bipolaris highlighted by lactophenol cotton blue stain. 
Pseudomonas aeruginosa, resistant to multi-drug, is seen in two cases. Those two cases actually had a history of cataract surgery in the affected eye less than one month ago. Uh, and they were diagnosed as postoperative endophthalmitis. They were first given intravitreal antibiotics and vitrectomy was done before proceeding to TKP. No organism could be isolated in other cases. This is a mechanism of isolating bacteria. These are the 20 cases showing demographic details, history, diagnosis and follow-up. Limitations of the study, it is small sample size, 20 is very small compared to thousands of TKPs undergoing in India every day. Post-operative follow-up was also not done, double culture was not done in cases where no organism was isolated. Discussion, non-resolving fungal keratitis, it is the most common indication of therapeutic keratoplasty accounting for 60% of cases of the study in par with the current studies. Males and young patients are particularly affected. Majority of the patients had rural background, low socioeconomic status and agriculture as their predominant occupation. One of the interesting findings we found in our study are, though the incidence of fusarium keratitis is far more than that of aspergillus in South India, like 60 to 40 ratio, the cure rate for natamycin and fusarium keratitis is more and hence the percentage of fusarium keratitis actually ending up in TKP are far less when compared to that of aspergillus keratitis. Uh, this is actually my thesis topic. My one year uh, sample size was 68 out of which 54 showed fungal positive, 28 out of 54 were aspergillus positive and six, only 16 showed fusarium positive. This, discre this discrepancy could be because of uh, natamycin being less penetrative than other antifungals and cure rates of natamycin is more for uh, uh, fusarium when compared to aspergillus and aspergillus being a more invasive disease. Further research need to, to be done to prove this. Finally, fungal keratitis is the most common indication for therapeutic keratoplasty. These are my references. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Moktika. Uh, Thank you. So, since you had a study on penetrating keratoplasty, yes, ma'am. Did you subject the corneal buttons that you had? Excised? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Did you we subjected subject the corneal buttons, ma'am? To the samples sent were initially before uh, TKP, we sent the corneal scrapings, ma'am. And then intraoperatively, we sent if any exudates in the AC, we sent those samples, and corneal button also was sent, ma'am. So, was and there I correlation? Went between pre and post? Ma'am, uh, generally most of the cases, pre-operatively only, we got the diagnosis, ma'am. So, out of 20, how many were positive microbiologically? Uh, of 14. 14. And in the rest of the 6, did no you get anything? No organisms could be isolated. Even in, on the corneal button? No, ma'am. No. Even on also, corneal button. Do you also subject them to histopathology? Yes, ma'am. So, half of the corneal button is sent for histopathology? Histopathology and yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma that was also not Not Thank you. I think okay. you can mention Six. that also. Okay, ma'am. Six cases were actually no organisms could be isolated, ma'am, even okay. after surgery. One most important uh, conclusion of your study was that the most of the peop uh, people with aspergillus infection, they end up more yes, than the... Yes, sir, fusarium. Okay, that's the, the first message thing. Yes, sir. The yes, first sir. thing is it is a government setup and we mostly use natamycin, sir. Thank and you. availability of auriculosis is not there. There are multiple reasons for that. Yes, sir. Yes. So, aspergillus and... Thank you. Yes, sir, Thank you. So today it's our opportunity and honor to welcome Dr. Gerald Schultz for his presentation. So we welcome you and uh, his topic is mysterious fatal ocular and systemic infections. Welcome, sir. Okay. Good morning. I want to share with you these very interesting, unfortunate cases. We'll start with the mystery of the missing cornea. This was a 63-year-old male that was referred to me because his condition was not improving. He was brought back to the emergency room, hospitalized, and this is what I was confronted with. No cornea. Multiple infiltrations. I did a direct swab. I was able to do it at the bedside because he was really uh, un unconscious. And this is what I grew, Klebsiella. Now let's talk through Klebsiella. I know some of this was already reviewed. We're interested in a hypervirulent pneumonia because this is community spread. It's the classic ones, is hospital acquired. We're interested in the worst ones with the uh, hypervirulent. It's gram-negative, non-motile, encapsulated. And here we can see the capsules around it. It's 
This protects the bacterium from the host, the biofilm protection from antibiotics. You can see the list of antibiotics. And the virulence is horrible. It produces proteases, mat matrix metalloproteases that can dissolve the protein in tissue, and it also releases collagenous. This is how it destroys the tissue, in this case, the eye. So the management after the reports with gram-negative rods were received, I used ceftrioxone, meropenem, I used everything, and still the infection remained. He was scheduled for an evisceration. His condition did not permit it. What I did is I poured betadine in it, lots of betadine, and you can see negative cultures. Finally, the family realized he was moribund, and they went home where he died in the presence of his family. Let's go into this one. Mystery of the ejected lens. I was presented with this. Here's the lens. Patient did her own cataract extraction, but you can see the way the eye looked. Again, we had inflammation in the brain. I did the same type of culture, and this is what we have of the lens. In this case, pseudomonas. Here's the classification, and the shape is slender rod shaped. It's uh, arranged singly or in pairs. Let's do the comparison between Klebsiella and Pseudomonas. You could read it yourself. Klebsiella is non-motile, Pseudomonas is. Um, Klebsiella straight rods and Pseudomonas slender straight rods. Main thing is Klebsiella is encapsulated. Again, family decided not to pursue further treatment and this patient died. Now the worst, this is the worst. And we already had lectures on fungus. This is a 30-year-old Iranian woman. She was allegedly assaulted by her guide as she was illegally crossing the Mexican border with her husband after vacationing in Mexico. She, a family member in the United States said, come, we'll take care of you, come across. Well, she was left in the desert. Husband was able to successfully get some help after an hour after she was brutalized in the uh, desert by her guide. Emergency crew sedated her, intubated her, and brought her to my hospital. These, oh, she had wounds in the legs, rhabdomyolysis of the muscle tissue, troponamines were in the body, CT of the lungs showed that it was terrible. L uh, legs were very tense, so she had surgery. And uh, then I was called because the pressure of the eye went up to 78, angle closure was suspected. I did a canthotomy, reduced some of the pressure. And uh, finally, we diagnosed her with mucomycosis, also staph aureus. And unfortunately, this is the way this beautiful woman who was an artist in Iran because a member of her family said, come to the United States. We can see the CT scan with levels, frontal sinus opacification. She also had hepatic and renal failure and placed on dialysis. And here, this is the infection, mucomycosis, they're horrible. We can see large, irregular, non-septate, ribbon-like hyphema and the mature sporangium of a mucor. These are the countries where COVID-associated mucomycosis has been detected. And of course, Iran, where she was from, and this thing blocked me, but that's her country. Sadly, she was considered moribund, the tube was removed, and she expired in the presence of her husband, who was totally distraught and inconsolable, since he had orchestrated, orchestrated this ill-fated crossing at the behest of a wealthy family member living in the United States who offered financial support if they came to live with him. It was said, fortunately, the ENT consultant we had was also Iranian, and uh, they were able to converse. He was also the intermediary. Is it what? Thank you. What's the most important message you want to convey to the audience? The, how horrible these fungal infections are. They've got to be diagnosed early. You can see how they could infiltrate the tissue and destroy it. 
You can see what happened to the eye, you can see what happened to the periorbital region, and it went throughout the system. Very aggressive. And the other message is, don't try to illegally cross into the United States. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Next speaker is Dr. Santosh Kumar. Santosh Kumar. Temporary keratoporosthesis assisted vitreoretinal surgery, a ray, a ray of hope. Is it not there? Is it there? Next. Okay, next. Next person is Dr. Rishabh Shah. Outcomes of uh, repeat autologous simple limbal epithelial transplant. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I'm going to be discussing the clinical outcomes of repeat simple limbal epithelial transplantation for ocular surface burns. I have no financial interests or conflicts of interest to disclose. So we all know that the stem cells in the limbus are at constant rate of division and they divide and mature and migrate over the corneal surface. Any insult to the limbus in the form of injury or chronic ocular inflammation can lead to stem cell deficiency and result in the loss of corneal transparency. In the setting of limbal stem cell deficiency, we can perform limbal stem cell transplantation and there are various methods of performing the transplantation which include a conjunctival limbal autograft, a cultured limbal epithelial transplantation or a simple limbal epithelial transplantation. So SLET is becoming widely popular and it has been shown to have a success rate of about 76% at a median follow-up of 1.5 years. However, in the most severe cases with, uh, with ocular surface burns, such as patients with symblephron and surface keratinization and lid abnormalities, even SLET fails to achieve any vascular surface. And then we are left with limited surgical options in the setting of a failed SLET. We found only a single case report of a child who had undergone a repeat SLET after the failure of a primary procedure. Outcomes of repeat CLET after a primary failed CLET and a repeat SLET after a primary failed CLET had been reported. This study aims to evaluate the effect effectiveness of a repeat a procedure for a larger sample size. The study was performed at Dr. Shroff Charity Eye Hospital in New Delhi. It was a retrospective case series starting from 1st May 2019 to 31st May 2023. The the, so we chose patients who were undergoing a repeat autologous simple limbal epithelial transplantation performed by a single surgeon with a post-op follow-up of six months. Then the evaluation of outcomes included visual acuity, recur recurrence of the LSCD, complications to the donor eye, and improvement in contact lens fit. The inclusion criteria was patients with uniocular, unilateral ocular surface burns with total LSCDs, and patients with partial LSCD and uh, LSCD resulting from other causes other than ocular surface burns were excluded. The primary outcome was the anatomical outcome, and it was classified as a successful outcome, which achieved an epithelized cornea with so no superficial vascularization and no symblephron, a partial success, which included clearing of the central cornea, reduction of the symblephron, and or, an, or an improvement in contact lens fit, and a failure, which included recurrence of LSED symblephron formation and no improvement in contact lens fit. The secondary outcome measures were functional outcome measures which included changes in visual acuity of the operated eye and the donor eye, any improvement in contact lens fit, and any complications of the repeat procedure. So we reported the outcomes in the form of means and proportions, and then we draw survival analysis plots based on the outcomes of the study. The results, in total we had 26 patients who underwent a repeat SLET but only 16 met the inclusion criteria of the study. The mean age of the patients was 20 years. The mean duration of the follow-up for this study was 17.3 months. In two of the patients, a repeat slit was performed together with a combined optical penetrating keratoplasty. This is a table that summarizes the demographic characteristics of the study population. I would like to highlight that there, there was one patient who had already undergone an optical penetrating keratoplasty before a second slit procedure. So the results, the primary outcome of the surgery, six patients achieved a successful outcome, that is a avascular epithelized corneal surface, four patients achieved a partial successful outcome, and six patients had a failure after the repeat procedure as well. There were 12 patients who had a preoperative symblephron, 
and out of these 12, five had a failed outcome, four had a partially successful outcome, and three had a successful outcome. The kaplan mayer survival plot analysis showed that the mean uh, time to failure of a repeat procedure was 22 months. Among the secondary outcomes, there was visual improvement in six patients, no improvement in visual acuity in six, in six patients attributable to stromal scarring, amblyopia, and PR inaccurate status preoperatively. And worsening of vision was noted in four patients, which was because of keratitis following the slit. Improvement in contact lens fit was seen in six patients. There was no change in BCV in any of the donor patient eyes. There were no intraoperative complications noted. The most common complication of the procedure was the failure of the procedure. In one patient, there was a retained fluid under the amniotic membrane within the first week, which was managed conservatively. In one patient, there was focal LSCD at the biopsy site in the donor eye, but there was no change in the visual acuity. Keratitis turned out to be a common complication of the repeat procedure. And uh, three of whom had sterile collimates, while one had a staphylococcal keratitis. In discussion, our stu the stu uh, conclude, please. Okay. I would just like to highlight one point that keratitis turns out to be a free, more frequent out, uh, complication of repeat slit as compared to a primary slit. We hypothesize that because these patients tend to have a, uh, extensive similar front tissue preoperatively, which contributes to the vascular supply of the anterior segment, dissection of this vascular tissue uh, compromises the anterior uh, circulate, uh, the vascular, supply, vascular supply of the anterior segment and predisposes to keratitis. Thank you. Why uh, amniotic membrane was not, I mean, did you use amniotic membrane yes, with yes. this? Yeah. I, I mentioned that in one yeah. patient there was fluid retained fluid. under the amniotic but membrane. But remaining people, I mean, remaining patients? No, no, we used amniotic membrane in and all with, of the patients. And but with sleep. in one patient there was fluid under the amniotic membrane in the perioperative period. And from where you got this slit? Harvested from? From the other eye. We included patients with unilateral LSCD only for this study. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rishabh. Uh, was there any modification in the technique of SLET when you repeated it? So, the modification, the primary modification was in the donor eye. We avoided the eye, uh, the part from where the previous biopsy was taken and we chose the area just adjacent to it. With respect to panis dissection, there wasn't much modification, but I would say that dissection of the panis in these cases is more difficult than in primary cases because there's already a lot of fibrosis and these are more severe cases of ocular surface injury. True. You didn't try mucous membrane graft? No. In this series, we have only included patients with who have undergone SLET. Although mucous membrane graft at our center, we mainly use it for patients with lid abnormalities, with secretarial entropion, and not for surface abnormalities. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned at one place that there were 22 months required for full recovery. No, no, no. That was my. Uh, that is a kaplan mayer survival curve. 22 months was the median. Uh, time to failure of the procedure. That means 50% of 50% of the repeat procedures failed at 22 months. And after have you the primary surgery? After the second surgery. After my but repeat your, surgery. But uh, your your study your uh, average duration of study was 17 months. Yes, mm -hmm. average was 17 months. However, the time to median time to failure was 22 months. 22 so, months. Mm -hmm. And have you tried tenon plasty? In, in this case, plasty, ma'am. Uh, no, at our center we prefer, mostly we do not do tenons plasty unless and until yeah. we do it in patients who present acutely with, uh, with more scleral ischemia. But these are mostly patients who have had multiple years after the injury and the surface is already covered with semblephron. Thank, Thank you. you. So next, next doctor, ocular surface squamous neoplasia, the unsung story of the tumor. Dr. Vanshika Khanna. Uh, last speaker is there. Shrikan Sahu. Okay. A very good morning, one and all. I'm Dr. Vanshika Khanna, and uh, I'm presenting the study, uh, OSSN, the unsung story of the tumor. Ocular surface squamous neoplasia is an umbrella term for a group of conjunctival tumors that include CIN and squamous cell carcinoma. It can be classified as mild, moderate, or severe by the degree of involvement of dysplastic epithelium. It presents with non-specific symptoms like redness, ocular irritation. Larger lesions may cause visual impairment by obstructing the visual axis and inducing astigmatism. Clinically, it is suspected in patients with raised conjunctival masses, 
increasing in size and having feeder vessels. The gold standard for confirmation of diagnosis is histological uh, and histological grading is a biopsy with histological evaluation. These tumors are relatively uncommon and data regarding the same is relatively scarce. The aim of my study is to evaluate clinical demographic characteristics and histopathological findings of OSSN. This is a prospective observational study conducted over a period of five years on 47 eyes of 47 patients presenting with conjunctival masses at our center. <coughs> Inclusion criteria, presence of conjunctival masses clinically suspicious of OSSN or symptomatic conjunctival growths with a base diameter less than 15 millimeters. Patients aged 21 to 80 years, willing for informed consent and follow-up. Exclusion criteria, conjunctival masses invading cornea, uh, sorry, other than uh, structures other than cornea or sclera. Patients with a previous history of surgery or chemo, pregnant and lactating females. A thorough history was taken and all the patients were subjected to slit lamp examination. The morphology and dimensions of the mass were noted. Routine blood investigations were followed. All patients underwent exceptional biopsy with two millimeters clear margin and the residual area was cauterized. This was followed by histopathological examination of the tissue. This is a preoperative image of a patient with OSSN, followed by a postoperative image of the same. Observation and results. The study included a total of 47 patients with 55% males and the rest females. The mean age at presentation was around 46 years. By occupation, most of them were farmers, followed by housewives, students, and servicemen. The mean duration of presentation was around six months, ranging from one to 30 months. In this study, systemic illness was found only in 10% of patients. Lesions were found more commonly in the right eye. Most commonly, the temporal side of the eye was involved, followed by the nasal side, inferiorly, and then superiorly. On histopathological examination, benign lesions were found in 31% cases, pre-invasive lesions in 48%, and invasive lesions in 19% cases. Thus, pre-invasive lesions were the most common. Among pre-invasive lesions, 10% was CIN1, around 6% was CIN2, and the rest was CIN3. Invasive SEC was found in around 12% eyes, and malignant melanoma was seen in 6% patients. Histopathological findings of these patients were compared with various parameters. A statistical significant association was found with age, duration of symptoms, and the size of the lesion. The p-values for the same were positive. This is the uh, tabulated form which presents the same. Coming to the discussion, OSSN is more common in young male adults as it is denoted by our study. This is in accordance with other studies the reason being more exposure to UV light in this group. Invasive lesions are, however, more common in the older age group. Occupation involving outdoor activities pose a higher risk, like farming. A shorter duration of presentation shows a statistically significant association and is more prone to invasion. Demographic factors which increase the risk are now known to be UV light, HPV infection, HIV infection, cigarette smoking, and older age group. The temporal part of the eye is most commonly involved owing to its increased exposure to sunlight. The size of the lesion shows statistically positive association with invasion risk, with larger lesions being more prone to invasion. Take home message, benign and pre-invasive lesions are found more commonly than invasive lesions. On histopathological examination, among benign lesions, squamous papilloma, and among invasive lesions, SEC is the most common. Hence, all the OSSN lesions should be evaluated carefully, examined histopathologically, and treated meticulously with proper excision. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, so one most important uh, message that your study gives that two thirds of these patients are usually non-malignant. Yes. And second, most important management uh, strategy remains excision. Excision with a uh, two That gives you both margin. diagnosis as well as treatment in good yes. number of the cases. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. We have short of time. We'll go for the next speaker now. Thank you, sir. So it is our privilege to invite the next speaker, Dr. Shrikant Sahu, for presenting the Odisha State Ophthalmological Society Best Paper, Outcomes of DMEC with or without peripheral iridotomy. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Shall I go? Yes, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today I will be talking about 
outcomes of DMIC with and without PI. You see the picture of PI here in the left and without PI on the right. So DMIC, as you know, is a very precise and targeted procedure which is which to replace the malfunctioning endothelium. To, uh, to put the scroll in place, we put air bubble so that the, the it gives a tamponade for graft detachment. But it has its own fallbacks. It leads to pupillary block in some cases and the, with a raised IOP. So to prevent that, we do a PI normally, what used to be done. So this PI can, could have been done by, by uh, YAG or during surgery, most often during surgery. But while doing a PI, it has two probable complications. One, it risks to high amount of bleeding because they are already inflamed eye. Two, there is a lot of pigment dispersal. The other, other aspect is their glare and uh, uh, photo which can, it can happen. In the year 2018, Linvi et al. first said that, okay, it can be done without PI. So then the thought process started that can we avoid this PI that it does, but without compromising the outcomes of the uh, DMAC. So what we did, we did compare the uh, results of DMAC with and without PI and to analyze the risk and uh, benefits of both approaches. So we included all patients of uh, DMAC with or without PI from January 2019 to 20, March 2023 with a follow up of six months, minimum six months. So we had in total 90 patients, 33 of them had uh, DMEC uh, with, with PI, 57 did not have a PI. The primary uh, outcome measure was pupillary block, the secondary outcome was graft detachment, rebubbling rates and best kind of visual acuity. If you see the baseline characters of the, both the groups are similar, uh, it had equal numbers of fake and pseudo fake guys, uh, the nearly similar amount of uh, Fuchs and PBK. The glaucoma was 6% in the, in, in the, with, the with PI and 10% in without. So the basically baseline characters of both the groups were same to start off. Now we come down to what did we see. The, we saw that the hyphema, which was our main concern, was around 10% in with PI and uh, around 3%, 3.5% in without PI. Though the numbers were less, but it was not statistically significant. The pupillary block was again half in without PI, but not statistically significant. What was surprising to us that the graft detachment was much less in without, with, without PI and it was statistically significant. And the visual equity were better than 2040 were actually similar in both the groups, a little higher on the with, without PI group. Now if you see this more, more closely, which are the grafts which failed? They, the, there were six in this in the group with, where 33 patients were there with with a, with, a, with a PI, and there were uh, 10 without PI. So, of you see, the actually the, wherever there was hypema post surgery, the graft failed. So uh, that so that means if PI is done and hypema happens, the graft will fail. So if we skip PI, it brings and uh, uh, there are two advantages. One, the graft becomes more predictable. The outcomes are better and it saves some time for the patient, uh, for the surgeon also. Because the time for two things, one, due to do the PI and if we have seen that the graft detergent is more if PI is done, so second uh, surgical time. What was a matter of concern, the, uh, why we did this is, because Indian eyes are more prone for uh, uh, angle closure. So uh, uh, PI was more prudent and more uh, necessary. But over the years we have seen it's not necessary as, as because even in India, it's, 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 it's very, uh, very safe. So, if you see, if you compare all the studies, historically, uh, of late, in 2023, only two, pu two publications have come in. Uh, our studies were equally good uh, in, in terms of the pupillary block, uh, rebubbling rate, which was 30% also actually better than uh, many of the studies. It was only 17% of rebubbling. If you see the graft detachment, it was much better than many other studies. So, to conclude, uh, DMEG without PI gives a comparable long-term results in terms of visual acuity and graft survival. It has a, it can, the graft with PI can have more chance of immediate post op com uh, complications like pupillary block and hypema. So, avoiding this step, we can have a better su surgical time, better efficient and more predictable surgery. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh
doctor, uh, this was something uh, uh, new or old where PI was a practice in cataract surgery. Now uh, yes. it is something uh, that you recommend in these uh, cases. With the what intention you want that this should be done? Uh, this should be, PI should be done. Uh, yes, uh, whatever was okay. the message of your study. So, so the, the, the what, why, what the intention of the study is that every surgery goes through a phase as you said a phase of transition and we improvised and a small step of improvisation each time helps to a better outcome and a better like as we saw the complication rates were decreasing the vision it becomes more predictable so over the time we cannot stay with the same thing what we are doing before we have to move one step ahead and make it more safe more uh, predictable, predictable surgery thank you thank you very much thank you sir so with this, we conclude this session. I thank you, my convener, Dr. Arundhati, Dr. Purvasha, and uh, Dr. Nasreen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all.